and good evening. It's Max here with Lunar Replicas. We're doing our second uh, live stream um, from the uh, from the Lunar Replicas shop here, as you can see behind me. Uh, our little wall of VIPs as well. They're joining us tonight uh, in spirit, I guess. So um, what I wanted to do today was answer some questions, uh, talk about some of the things uh, that, that um, a lot of folks have questions about or just uh, explain some things if you guys have uh, any specific things about our, you know, questions about our products or stuff we might make in the future or suggestions about stuff that we should do in the future. Um, now's the time, you know, and anytime, info at lunarreplicas.com, email me. Uh, or just message the uh, Facebook page, but um, and then we can sit and chat for a while. You guys uh, feel free to um, ask questions in the comments. I'm I'm reading the comments. Uh, I got a couple of things I'm going to work on too. If we uh, get done sooner rather than later, I'll sit down and um, work on some stuff, and uh, we'll go from there. So I wanted to do one thing first. Uh, one of the most numerous questions we get is. What is the difference between your jackets? Um, among the different jacket types, type 1, type 1A, type 2, type 3, and then, a, you know, the winter uh, version of the jackets and stuff. So I took some of them out here, and we can go through that and just a little bit of the history um, behind uh, the jackets. All right, so let's get started. Actually... I forgot to do this. Let's let's spice this up just a little bit. Here we go. One, two, three, boom. That's not perfect, but okay. All right. So what we have here in order is the type one, type two, and type three jackets. Um, I will warn you, um, the color that you see underneath these lights, these are actually uh, dimmable LED lights. Let me, let me turn them up real quick, actually. So you'll see, actually, the color changes in different lights. Uh, that, that really goes for any fabric, but especially the blue and gold here. Just for some reason, um, you know, the human eye doesn't see blue all that well, uh, or at least in, it, it, it sees it in various different shades there's you know thousands of different shades of blue um, the original jackets and the original flight suits were um, all basically made out of the same uh, let's see I see I can't even tell that okay this is an original and this is an original okay flight suits and jackets were basically made out of the same material um, it was a poly cotton twill uh, lightly um, weather treated so that it wouldn't stain. Um, so the earlier ones did stain. You can actually see in some of the original NASA photos some of the jackets are getting real dirty, especially around the sleeves and stuff where jackets usually get dirty. Um, but the by, by the later part of Gemini program and early Apollo when they switched over to, or mi, uh, mid Apollo when they switched over to the Type 2 jacket, um, there was a little bit more waterproofing, but in any way, I, I just wanted to point out the color of the fabric. Our original Type 2 jacket that was on loan matches this jacket exactly. The, um, the, the flight suit and this jacket are like in the same family, but this is a little bit more teal. And then the Type 1 and the Type uh, 2 flight suit it's actually, it's, it, it looks more blue on camera and in this light, but in reality, they're really close. The Type 1 and uh, Type 2 jackets, um, suffice it to say, that's a long way of saying, blue is a really hard color to match. <laughs> and we got really close. Um, it's all in the same family, but there are variations through the years. There are variations based on, um, you know, what, what uh, era... Uh, or I'm sorry, what dye lot uh, they were done, but but we pretty sure we matched the type one as close as possible, and we certainly matched the type two as close as possible, um, and our flight suits match the type two also. 
we'll talk about the lining material real quick. This is an original winter weight jacket from, um, it's a type one winter weight with the, what we're calling signal flare red, uh, because it's pretty unique. It, um, it is not the orange or the, the, uh, uh um, emergency orange or, or I forget what it's called international orange or or uh, other lining materials uh, here man under these lights it looks really orange in real life it's a lot more subdued we matched the lining material exactly that is one thing we did get absolutely um, 100 percent on so the lining material for the flight wear jackets the blue jackets was used as the shell material on some of these, so, uh, uh, this style emergency um, uh, survival jacket that has like a, a furry fleece lining, this, uh, this synthetic fur. And again, this is an original. This is Walt Cunningham's is on loan to us from a very good friend of ours. Um, but it, it just it illustrates that the lining material we got absolutely perfect. Hey everybody that's joining us, we just got started just a couple minutes ago, um, just going through some of the fabrics and how we, you know, our methodology for going through this. Now one thing about this material is, it is a really heavy, it's about a 8 or 9 ounce nylon material and it matches, if you can see in the, there, just a little bit, it, it tries to match the... Um, the texture of silk it's got a it's got kind of a woven texture in it that looks like silk it's you can feel it actually and it's very heavy like I said it's uh, it's about a seven eight ounce uh, material may almost even nine ounces this is no longer made it's impossible to get um, we found some dead stock originally and uh, we got kinda close dying the dead stock but it crinkled and made this very strange um, uh, the, the chemical when it was dyed made a very strange crinkle to it. So we got as close as we could on the material and the weight, uh, but we're absolutely certain we got the color. Uh, as you can see, the color is not even a shade off. It's, it is the same color, um, and the material is just about the same weight, a little bit different um, thickness, and none of this I, we could not get. There's no way to reproduce that that uh, pattern, um, that silk-like pattern, it's just not made anymore. Um, so just, a, just an example, we'll put this to the side here actually because when we get to the winter weight we'll talk about that. All right, so type 1 jacket. What's the time period for this? Oh, we got a like on Facebook, look at that. <clears throat> type 1 jacket is a lighter weight material it's still blue with the signal flare red lining uh, it's lighter weight like I said it is not weather treated so it's very soft it has silver snap buttons on the two pockets and at the waist tab it has an exposed navy blue zipper on the sleeve pocket or the cigarette pocket as some guys called it um, What's interesting about the zipper also is on almost all military um, flight suits, even today, they have a brass stop at the top of the zipper that reinforces um, that entire, the entire zipper in the pocket there. These are very hard to come by, especially in raw brass. They're now uh, uh, black, um, uh, black anodized uh, uh, on flight suits and stuff now. So this is the... Uh, Exposed zipper on the Type 1 and the Type 1A. That's, the, that's really the main difference is the zippers and the snaps. Um, type 1 does have a, like I said, it does have that softer material. It's not weather treated at all. Um, if you go online, you can actually look up Jim Lovell's Gemini era Type 1 jacket came up for sale just a few years ago. And uh, we met the owner of that actually at Space Fest uh, this past year. <clears throat> and... Um, uh, I was wearing this jacket actually, and he, he said, "I didn't know they, they, there were any of these else for sale." And I said, "Oh no, it's not an original. It's it's our replica." So so they are very well regarded. Um, the the fabric that we did for this was original old stock fabric, 
We dyed it to match that that color. We cannot get this anymore, unfortunately. However, we can get the Type 2 fabric. Uh, and we can get the Type 2 fabric uh, without the weatherproofing, and it gets it a little bit closer to the original Type 1 fabric. So if we do the Type 1 fabric, or if we do the Type 1 jackets again, uh, they will be in untreated Type 1 fabric. It'll be very close, but um, you know, the original run of Type 1 jackets were, were really kind of special. The other part about this also, the zipper is undyed, it's a, or it's a khaki dyed zipper. So this, the main zipper does not match the pocket zipper, which is very strange. That's, that's really the only era uh, of this jacket where the zippers weren't matching in some way. The original zippers were made by a company called Conmar, and they had this bell-shaped, there's a little thread in there, sorry about that, this little bell-shaped pull which we recreated. Uh, let's see if this one has it. No, this, oh, here it is. You see, that's the original Conmar zipper. This is actually, guys, this is a ring off of a, um, uh, I don't know how this wound up here, but we, we, there is provenance to that. This is a ring off of an original flight checklist that was flown on, I think it was either Apollo 14 or Apollo 17, somehow managed to be on this jacket. And he, <laughs> the collector called us and said, hey, don't, don't take that ring off. <laughs> Um, I left it there. So I, I've left it on there when we return this back to our uh, our friend. It'll go back. But so this is the original Conmar zipper. Uh, and you see the stop, by the way. You see the brass stop up there, right there. So we, we recreated the zipper head. Uh, we don't have permission to use the name Conmar, so we used a blank zipper head there uh, but we did match it as close as possible i think this is a number four zipper um, and they're pretty smooth uh, they are brass teeth zippers so when they're new they're a little bit sticky um, but as you as you wear them since they're they're natural brass they uh, they loosen up and they they uh, go in um, Scott, thank you for the compliment. We uh, we did not cut corners. This took over a year in development, and I can say um, several tens of thousands of dollars went into getting everything right before they even before the first jacket was even made. Um, so I'm I'm very personally I'm very proud of uh, of what we've created here. They are absolutely as close as possible to museum uh, what is in the museum, and when you put it on, you can you can enjoy wearing. And that's not to say. Don't wear it. It's to say, please wear it. Please, absolutely wear them. Uh, the other thing is, obviously, the uh, the knits. <clears throat> they're a um, they're a poly wo uh, a wool blend knit. Um, it's interesting also about uh, this time period is they weren't necessarily using uh, flame proof um, materials. Uh, Aramid and Nomex and stuff did not really start being used in military equipment until the late 60s and later into the 70s uh, you know during and after the Vietnam War but you know so these jackets started the type 1 jacket really started in about I think 64 65 might have been the first year that we found uh, pictures of it that's why I put the two line uh, Gemini style tag on on this one and it is we did base uh, our, our original uh, our, our our type 1 jacket off of the um, auction of, of Jim Lovell's jacket. Okay, so type 1 jacket. Again, just a real quick hash. Khaki main zipper. Uh, lighter weight, um, uh, untreated fabric. It's a little bit softer. Um, oh, oh, yeah, also the, uh, the thread is a, a lighter color. Uh, on the type 2, the thread basically matches um, the, uh, the fabric. The type 1 the uh, the thread is a little bit lighter color, and also on the Type One A, the Al Warden jacket, um, which which we are matching a middle. It's it's kind of it's the hybrid between the Type One and the Type Two is the Al Warden jacket. Exposed khaki, or I'm sorry, exposed navy blue zipper, khaki main zipper, silver snaps, uh, untreated fabric. Type 1. That is the Type 1 jacket. We sold them with the Type 1 patch also, which is also correct for the Gemini period, where they were interchangeably using the Type 1 and the Type 2 um, meatball patch. The Type 2 jacket is uh, same thing, a blue outer shell with the signal flare red lining. 
matching thread all throughout as you can see more a little bit on the on the pocket here those are called bar tacks so on the bar tacks you can really tell uh, and that's how we identified it in original photos the sleeve zipper is now reinforced it's the same everything's the same inside there there's even the brass stop inside it is a conmar style zipper um, the reinforcing here just closed the zipper so that it was not i guess it wouldn't get snagged on things it became pretty common um, there is actually a reinforcing uh, cord inside the edge here, a tightly woven cord that's sewn in um, that, that strengthens this edge so it doesn't fray. By the way, you guys, uh, something we've been trying to offer, but I have to get more of them, is the Scripto, the original Scripto pencils. These were issued on all the way up through early Apollo missions before they switched over to a... Uh, to a stainless steel pencil, but these are really great, actually. I mean, strangely enough, these are 50-year-old pencils. The the the, the uh, erasers are still in good shape. So I, I actually use these quite a bit around the shop. They came in blue, too. There was a blue... Do I have it over here? No. There was a blue uh, version, and it had blue pencil ink in it. Or, I'm sorry, uh, pencil lead in it as well. So Type 2 jacket. A little bit heavier weight stain resistant and water resistant fabric on the outside and no kidding guys it really is water water resistant almost waterproof if you if you have them dry cleaned uh they soften up just a little bit but they're still um they are still pretty water resistant um when we were at space fest it poured outside and i walked outside on camera and stood in the rain it really the water just beads off it so again, that'll go away with time. That's what we see on the originals is, uh, is the um, waterproofing has, has reduced a little bit. But when they're new, they're a little bit crispy and they're uh, really quite waterproof. So this, I've worn this for a little while and it's now, it now feels great. Um, type 2 jacket also has the navy blue main zipper. Uh, if you look inside here, it's navy blue also. It's either navy blue or black depending on... You know when they were made some of the originals have black in there um, black snaps in all three places um, and we include what we what we're calling the type 3 meatball patch this is the same patch as the last style meatball patch that was worn on the outside of uh, spacesuits in the Gemini period and early Apollo the uh, um, uh, <clears throat> Gus, Ed, and Roger on Apollo 1 were wearing these on their spacesuits uh, when they sadly perished. Um, and also on the recovery jumpsuits of Apollo 11, they were wearing the Type 3 patch. Type 3 patch is really neat, actually. This is the last patch that had the white border before they switched to the blue border. This is a Type 5 patch with the blue border. Type 3 patch had serifed letters, which is neat. You see the little, little stones on the top and the bottom of the letter? Serifed letters... The Type 1 and 2 patch were very similar. They had a very mild serif. But the Type 3 patch went to a very, you know, old school style serif. Um, and the outer, the outer uh, uh, white ring here got a little bit thicker. As you see, the Type 1 is a little bit more refined. This, is, this came into use in 1959. Uh, and then about by 1966, 67, these showed up and they, they didn't go away until about 1970. Um, the blue, the blue edge patch, the type four and five, the type four is a little bit smaller than this, than the type five patch were around the same time, 69, 70, 74 thereabouts. And then they switched to the, the worm. So type one and type two jackets, the type one, a jacket will match the Al Warden jacket. He is wearing in this photograph. And that is. An, expo an exposed sleeve zipper in navy blue, a navy blue main zipper, and black snaps. So it's basically, it's a type 2 jacket with an exposed zipper. Um, and when we talked to Al about it, that's what he wanted to do. Uh, we're we're going to also include, though it wasn't on his original jacket, we're going to include a, uh, a NASA patch and an um, American flag. And you can see... He's got one of the Scripto pencils right there in his pocket. Same pencil. Check it out. Type 1, Type 2, 
Type 1A will be basically this jacket with an exposed uh, sleeve zipper just like this. Um, also, uh, every one of Al Warden uh, Special Edition jackets will come with a hand-signed photo from Al. Um, these photos were uh, printed and signed by him uh, in February, I believe, January, February, and uh, um, we're very proud to have these. They, every, every jacket will have one of these uh, included. The Type 3 jacket, as you can see, there is now a new departure. They changed color. It's now gold. Uh, it, it's really kind of a mustard color, and it's like a deep mustard khaki in, um, in person. It no longer has the signal flare red lining. It went, they went to a white lining. Same material, though. It's, a, it's a, like a nylon material. Um, actually, the manufacturer changed too. So uh, it had been land manufacturing. Flightwear was made by land manufacturing in Wichita, Kansas, as you can see here. Land manufacturing, Wichita, Kansas. They switched over uh, the gold jackets and all the gold flight suits were made by a company called Kings Point. And actually, uh, the one here, the one on the mannequin, let's see. No, oh, I can't do that. It's a little too tight. This is an original uh, gold flight jacket. Oh, I'm sorry, flight suit. Bob Overmeyer's um, gold flight suit from around the uh, Apollo 17 era, which is when you really see everybody switch over to gold. Um, his is faded a little bit, but as you can see, the uh, if if you looked on the inside of the pockets. Uh, the color is really close to what we what we got. This uh, the color that we did was based on this flight suit, uh, as if it were new. Yours will fade up to be about the same. It's like a like I said, it's like a mustard um, khaki. But so that is that is an original Apollo flight suit, and an original or uh, our Type Three flight jacket right next to each other. Again, these come with a little bit more weatherproof, and we, we, we added a little bit more because we know it's a lighter color and it could be, um, it could get stained more easy. They come, they're a little bit crispy, um, but as you wear that, this, I've, I've had this dry cleaned once and I've worn it for about a month. It's already almost as soft as a Type 2 jacket right out of the box. So um, keep wearing the Type 3 and you'll really like it. Um, couple of differences with the Type 3, they now started using a uh, covered zipper. This is single stitched rather than uh, double stitched on the outside of the zipper. It's single stitch and there's now a cover over the main zipper which is also it's like a dark gray um, almost a black. Um, and they also switched to using a leather tab on all of the zipper pulls. So there's a leather tab on the main zipper leather tab here. As you can see on the flight suit they even started using a um, piece of piece of the material. Is this a Conmar zipper? No. Shipper. Oh, it's a shipper zipper. Or gripper zipper. Anyway. Um, other than that, the pattern's almost exactly the same. The only major difference is the, the waist tab has now gotten squared off. It's a square rather than being rounded, which is how it had been since the Type 1 jacket. So Type 3 jacket has, a, has a, obviously it's made, a, it's a different color. Um, leather on the zipper pulls. Black snaps. Covered main zipper, covered uh, sleeve zipper. Type 5 patch we'll be putting on it. Also the Velcro. Um, and they kept this configuration for a while. At some point it did switch over with the Type 5, uh, type five patch on the right side. They moved to the military style, which is... Uh, leather name tape on the left and um, the left chest uh, and the um, NASA patch on the right. Prior to that it was all, almost always uh, NASA patch on the left and name tape on the right. Type 3 jacket. Coming out as soon as uh, coronavirus is over basically. They're almost done. Type 2 jackets are in stock right now. Type 1 jackets we're looking at sometime possibly in the fall of uh, releasing 
a uh, another run of type one jackets. Something we toyed around with doing is a winter style type three jacket. We have this listed on the site now, just if you want to sign up and, and put your name down to see if we, we, we may or may not do these. We'll see how much interest there is. But what it is, is basically the same evolution that we were talking about earlier, where the lining material, lining material was used, type one lining material was used as a winter weight jacket, an emergency jacket with this fleece lining. This is an original. Uh, it is the line, it is exactly the same material, that nylon lining material. Theoretically, I guess it's a little bit more waterproof. It's nylon, so it, uh, you know, it's a man-made material. So we kind of did, oh, and, and you can see there are photos and a few surviving examples of a blue version of this. It's a type 2 jacket, but the, but the material is dyed blue. Blue with um, black snaps and um, sleeve zipper the same way. It's almost exactly the same as a Type 2 jacket, except it has blue nylon material on the outside, a fleece lining, um, and the same patches and stuff. Gene Cernan liked to wear that quite a bit. If you look around, you'll see him wearing a, uh, a Type 2 winter jacket. So we did kind of a version of that in gold. We made a Type 3 winter jacket. Now, I, I couldn't find original photos of any of these made but we managed to get the gold material. It's pretty close to the um, satin, you know, just the standard Type 3. So we did a Type 3 jacket, basically like a Type 2, and we used a um, just a really high-grade fleece, white fleece lining. We can get this material, the fake fur, but I got to tell you, having uh, worn this fake fur before on other military coats, this is used on, I think, the... Uh, M42, uh, M43 liners used a similar kind of thing. They are unbelievably warm, like uncomfortably warm, unless it's like 10 or 15 degrees outside. Um, this fleece was a little bit less warmth, um, but I wore this jacket out in about 20 degrees over the winter, and I was fine. You know, it is a short coat. It is supposed to come up to the waist. Uh, they are meant to be comfortable while you're seated in an aircraft. So it really should fall at your belt line or just above your belt line for, for this time period. If you guys order jackets and um, they don't come down past your butt like a modern jacket does, even an MA1 sometimes, if you order the wrong size, they can be real uh, long. Uh, these jackets are meant to be worn at the waist, at the natural waist, um, if you're wearing um, trousers. So, yeah, I see a lot of people saying, uh, yes, please do them. If you guys go on the website under the flight, uh, flight jacket and, and suits section, you'll see the winter weight type 3 jacket listed. If you guys put your email down there under what size you want, we're, you know, that's, that's the way of telling me that you guys want that. Um, and we'll, we'll keep an eye on those, maybe do some pre-orders and then do a run. We're looking at doing both this and the red one. We're doing the Signal Flare red um, replica of the original one. Again, the gold is kind of a... I, I don't have original evidence that this existed. There is a blue one that did exist. Um, we're not doing that one just yet. But, because uh, like, it's not really as nice. Actually, the gold turned out to be a lot nicer fabric. Now, in this light and on the camera, this looks a lot yellow, a lot more yellow than it is in person. In person, it's, um, it's closer to the khaki color. It's closer, it's just a little bit more gold. But, um, yeah, they're really cool. They're nice. They're very warm, and they, they're just sharp. It's a sharp jacket. Okay, Taylor Johnson, are you still uh, watching the show here? If you are, he was the one that asked, could I show some jackets, prototype jackets, that we haven't shown anyone before? Absolutely, Taylor. I certainly can. And everyone who else is watching should thank you for asking that question. We are looking at doing... A civilian version and other military versions of these jackets. So the L2 jacket was the inspiration. The original L2 jacket, the Air Force War, was the um, possibly the original inspiration for the 
NASA flight jackets. Uh, they're not exactly the same, they're similar, but basically what they are, um, the NASA flight jacket is just a blue version of the L2 jacket. So what we just did, just while we were making the gold uh, winter sample, we got some more nylon material. Here is a sage green. Again, under this slide, it doesn't look like sage green. This is a sage green um, version of the uh, Type 3 jacket. This is something almost exactly what the Air Force version would look like. It had um, it had some uh, shoulder straps. Uh, it had a it had a piece on the front here for I believe the respirator mask uh, would go through here. Uh, we don't have those on. This was really just a sample, uh, and we did it with the white lining. The originals would have had uh, either white or the signal flare red or like a red uh, uh, a red version. Okay, so this is kind of the civilian version, sort of a military color with the civilian version. But we're also looking at doing some other colors. This is a gray, a gray type 3. Yeah, Dane, that's a great point. Uh, this, is, this is much closer to the original uh, L2 color. It's, it's a very deep like a number, I think it's a number six OD. Um, if khaki is number three and like uh, sage is like a number four, this is, I believe, a number six, if not the, uh, if not a number four uh, itself. But this is, this is closer to an L2. I do not have an original L2, but my manufacturer does. So this is like a battleship gray, a little bit lighter than battleship gray. If this is, this, the, the lining is white. You can see it is not white. But this, how cool would that look with a couple of NASA patches on it or, you know, whatever else you guys wanted. Um, it's really neat. I've worn this around. It gets a lot of compliments. Um, the quality and workmanship is exactly the same as our, as our jackets. Oh, yes, also I, I'd like to note uh, our Type 2 run took a long time because we were trying to source um, new knits. Our, our knit manufacturer on the Type 1 run, we did a very nice job. Uh, either went out of business or stopped picking up the phone or, you know, was staying at home, drinking wine and eating cheese. But they didn't return our calls. And when I asked them to order um, several thousand more pairs of, uh, of knits, uh, they didn't answer the phone. So we, we had to go elsewhere. And thank God that we did because the new knits are really phenomenal. I really, really like uh, the new knits. They're a little bit thicker. They're closer to what the original one was actually. And take a look. Here's the original, and here is. Sorry, oops. Um, they actually step down. The weave actually changes midway through, and it's a mechanical weave that keeps it tight. It's not um, necessarily elastic, so there's nothing to die in here. It's uh, it is mechanically um, tight. So, Taylor, that answers your question. We have a couple other things we're looking at doing so, uh, that are non-historic, uh, and those are just two of the of the samples. Yeah, the gray and the white, uh, we, we also did, I don't have them here, they're in the other room. Um, there was a black, uh, like, a, like an MA1 jacket, um, and a couple other colors. I mean, the sky's the limit. If we get uh, a color, we can do it. So that's what I got for you guys today, uh, just talking about the different types of jackets and our sort of our process and some of the stuff that we've done, um, how we developed certain things. My, here we go. Let's see if I can flip this around again. Oh, I'm back. Look at that. Um, that's, our, that's our process. Uh, that's, that's the difference between the Type 1, 2, and 3 jackets and possibly a new civilian line uh, run or military style. Um, I have some work to do. If you guys want to stick around and um, watch me do a couple more uh, leather name tags. Oh, you know what? I did actually. I promised somebody I would show them this. Okay, I found the keys to the case. <laughs> it's my case. I should know how to get into it. Somebody asked what this watch is. And this is a Bulova Accutron Astronaut. This is an original, uh, just recently uh, mechanically restored. 
Accutron astronaut um, made by Bulova. And these were ordered by the CIA and NASA to fly um, both the X-15 and the, uh, the precursor to the SR-71 Blackbird. Um, these use a, um, it's really amazing, if you ever look it up, uh, there's some great YouTube videos that explain how these work. It's a tuning fork movement, uh, basically a, a electromagnetic tuning fork vibrates very quickly and that is the heartbeat of this, of this watch. It's still mechanical but it uses an electrical impulse to vibrate a uh, uh, the basically the hairspring, if you if you will, the hairspring side of the watch, rather than having a mainspring that's wound up like the uh, the Speedmaster, Speedmaster you wind up a mainspring, and it vibrates the mainspring at a certain speed. Um, this has a battery that vibrates a tuning fork at a very at a much faster speed, uh, and and maintains that that accuracy. Um, they were, I believe they were uh, designed to be accurate to, uh, Swiss accuracy is five seconds plus or minus a day. I think these were about five seconds um, a week, uh, maybe even hot, better than that. They used the exact same tuning fork movement. This is the 214 Boulevard uh, tuning fork movement. Um, they use that in clocks, uh, you know, wall, desk clocks, wall clocks, and clocks on spacecraft and aircraft uh, in the dashboard. So they they, they could sustain um, accuracy even when next to a, an aircraft engine. You know, aircraft aircraft clocks really have to take a lot of abuse. Um, is that a Frank Borman size bubble helmet? No, that's a standard size bubble helmet. Why did Frank have a very large head, or does does Frank have a very large head? I know that Charlie Duke has a very large head. For some reason, uh, he, he made a joke when we went and fit a hat to him that he has uh, a giant head, and I think his head's about the same size as mine. <laughs> so, yes, I can confirm that. Where did I have the watch restored? Um, if you look online, there's a, there's a website, um, Accutron... Oh, shoot, I forget the name. It was like Accutron214.com or something like that. He's one of the only guys that does them. I think he had been a Bulova Accutron tech, you know, 30, 40 years ago, um, and he uh, and <laughs> and he uh, uh, he still restores them. He does a great job. Um, couple month turnaround, but uh, I mean, it's 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 absolutely right, and this watch is absolutely worth doing. This is you know you can pick these up for five or six hundred bucks, and you know they. They uh, they're going to go up in value. I, I I honestly believe even even if they don't go up in value, you have something that's really cool, and that is the original watch. Now, comparatively to something like a um, Speedmaster, talking about a watch that that starts at about three thousand um, dollars. So, you know, having an original vintage nineteen sixties watch, and this one actually, the there is a date code on it. Uh, this is. M9, yeah, this is from 1969. This is an original from 69. You try to pick up an original 1969 um, Speedmaster, you're talking about two, three thousand, uh, I'm sorry, three to five, three to six thousand, just, just to get started. Um, that's in U.S. dollars. Latest thing I picked up recently is a Snoopy pin. This is a early Apollo Snoopy pin. Um, I don't know a whole lot about these, but this one came up from a friend of mine, and I wound up picking it up. Uh, we will not be reproducing this. Um, this is something really special, and they uh, those are those are really cool. Um, oops! For all you Wally Shira fans out there, are you a turtle? Answer, answer in the comments. Are you a turtle? Come on, let's focus. Oh, let's see what else we have here. Somebody asked about this. This is the uh, same slide rules that were taken on the Apollo program. That is an N600 ES. That's right. And you know what the ES stands for? Is Easy C. They were 
they were made in yellow so your eyes wouldn't go uh, cross-eyed using it all uh, all all day flown hardware uh, that's a great question my, one of my only pieces of flown hardware is this if I can get it out this is a um, flight checklist piece signed by Dick Gordon from Apollo 12 uh, this was yeah this was uh, flown on Apollo 12. Piece of, one of the one of the back pages uh, where you would put some notes. That's right. I see some folks answering. Are you a turtle? There is a right answer to that. If you get it wrong, you're buying drinks for everybody. Oh, this is flown too. Actually, this is a piece of Apollo hardware from. Uh, sorry, from Apollo 15. This is a screw off of the uh, command module uh, main panel. A guy was selling them a couple uh, months back. Oh, and this is a piece of the uh, the bench from Apollo 13. Yeah, uh, the Apollo couches. Yeah. For, oh, Fred Hayes signed that. I don't remember that. Cool. Yeah, that's a piece of couch off of Apollo 13. Um, I have here, this is unflown, but it is original NASA hardware. This is a... Um, this is a pilot's preference kit, a PPK, from uh, around about Apollo 17 era. I'm not going to take it out. It, it is sealed in the original uh, bag, um, but this is a pilot's preference. Ah, what the hell, I'll take it out. Stand by, everybody. Check out the escape tower on there. Right here, that is a that is an original PPK, serial number one two two eight, SEC one two one zero 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 eight seven dash three zero one. This is a PPK, and you see the clean for service, uh, and you'll notice we actually we copied that clean for service tag uh, right here. So this is our copy of the clean for service tag on on every bag that we send out. Um, you can see where it came from. A little bit different. We put our address on their website, Made in USA, and MKK, and our own uh, inspection stamp. Uh, and there's the tag here, too. This is a spacecraft parts tag. Dated, what date was this? 1974. This is when it went into storage. I believe, yeah, 71, 74, 74. So not quite uh, 17 era. This is, you know, Skylab era or a little bit later. And a little Snoopy. Snoopy became kind of the mascot of the Apollo program, and it would be really neat if we could do something with them. Uh, but get, I think getting the licensing to do it is um, is a little bit difficult. And everything we do here is above board. So I'm going to work on some stuff. Because I've got... Let's see how much battery I have left. Oh, we're good. Last time I got down to like 2%. I'm going to work on a couple of name tags. And if you guys have questions, um, feel free to ask. <coughs> Somebody asked um, uh, a little while ago, actually, about my glasses. Uh, so um, they've been made continuously since the 1940s by a company called Shuron. Uh, Shuron has made these exact same pair of glasses for you know almost 70 years, and um, they are the brow liner glasses. Um, and uh, Ray-Ban now makes them as well for the last, you know, several years. But uh, these are the original style. Okay. Any questions while we, uh, while I'm here trying to work on a couple things? How did I get started in all of this? Uh, I answered that last time, but but basically I'm interested. Um, I love history, and I, I used to do uh, a lot more with uh, reenacting and stuff like that. And this is kind of an extension of being able to bring historical... Um, uh, interpretation to um, the NASA period, which I think just the, the stuff is so cool, you know, especially the gear. Oh, that's what I wanted to talk about. Okay.
Where is it? Where is it? Is this, uh, where's the batteries? Well, anyway. So I put, I put something up today about this. Several people have emailed me um, over the past year complaining about something that their Apollo pen lights wind up getting dull. They buy them, they use them, they wind up turning all sorts of colors, they make their hands smell kind of funny. Um, and that is because they are raw brass. This is, this is raw brass. And what is brass? It's copper, nickel, and tin, I believe. Uh, mostly copper. And um, copper is naturally antimicrobial. And it occurred to me today that uh, if you had this in your pocket and you just kind of rubbed your hands on it a little bit, uh, they've been selling stuff on, on Amazon now and on Facebook everywhere. You know, a piece of, a piece of copper, uh, you know, ha put it on your keychain and you sit there and you can wash your hands with it. I, I wouldn't go that far, but suffice it to say, if this did get germs on it, and you put it on your um, on your cabinet overnight. Uh, I believe uh, brass uh, copper copper kills 99% of bacteria and virus and stuff within three hours. So whatever does get on it will be dead by the morning or within a few hours. Uh, it cannot survive on raw brass. Um, so great everyday carry piece. I uh, this one does not have batteries in it, um, but it is a LED, that's the only major upgrade here is this LED, and it runs off two AA batteries. Uh, it is a 100, um, 100 lumen output, and they're made by a company. Barbo Light's main, main bread and butter is making dive lights for scuba divers and professional divers. Um, so there's actually, there's a rubber gasket on the inside. Come on, focus. Let's go focus. Anyway, there's a rubber gasket on the inside. So these are waterproof. They're waterproof to, I think they said 100 feet. Um, it's not rated or anything like that, um, but it is waterproof. You don't have to worry about them too much. Two AA batteries, and it lasts um, a long time, actually. I don't think I've ever changed the one. I've, I've uh, used one pretty much every day for about a year and a half, two years, and um, I've never um, changed them. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to be the one to say it's the cure for uh, coronavirus, but it will, uh, I, I mean, it will, a brass, raw brass, uncoated and untreated brass, this does not have any kind of clear coat on it. Most brass doorknobs and things that you see that's bright, uh, shiny brass out in, out in the wild are um, um, coated uh, with, with a clear coat, and you get none of the properties of the brass through the clear coat. Um, so this is not clear coated. And, and I just washed my hand. No, I'm just kidding. That's not, that will not work, but this will not, uh, nothing will survive on it. So now that I've talked about that for 10 minutes, um, you ask, what, where did I get the wrist calendar on my Forstner band? For one thing, we sell the Forstner bands. We're in partnership with them uh, to retail their bands, and we, we can offer the same price as they do. Um, I love them. They're really, really well made. I have a, a few originals. Let me, uh, let me show you guys here. I have several originals that are now getting that are getting very difficult to find. This is this is the original band, uh, and if you find them now, they're about a thousand bucks. And no kidding, they 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 got very expensive very quickly. This was fifteen dollars in nineteen sixty five. They come in a lovely box. Just be careful of those magnets. There is a uh, neodymium magnet in the cover here. Just keep it away from your watch. Probably a good idea. Um, here's the replica. It's not even a replica. It's a reissue. The, the company opened again. The guy uh, opened it back up. Um, has the original trademark. It is... Uh, it is a continuous line, and it is the reissue of this thing. It is not a replica. They're absolutely perfect. I wear one every day. 
The story uh, behind them is really quite interesting. The, the bands that came with the Omega watches, I think it was the 1038, uh, reference 1038 band that came with the Omega Speedmasters, were a little bit too um, sturdy. They were, they were really well made, and they're stainless steel. Um, so much so that if they wore it on the outside of a suit, or if they even wore it on their wrist and it got snagged on something, uh, it was more likely to hurt uh, your, your hand and your wrist or the outside of the suit. Um, so they found a cheap, relatively cheap, but yet sturdy, um, adjustable strap from a, from a jewelry store, a replacement strap, um, and authorized that for wear with, uh, with the Speedmaster watches. Um, this could possibly, it would break away a little bit easier than the original Omega one would. Where did I get the calendar, the H style calendar? with today's date on it is April 2020. Um, the uh, April, uh, I'm sorry, Jackson Office Supply, and we'll put a link up, uh, carries, carries today's date um, wrist, uh, wrist calendars. And, and you know, it's interesting, I put it on because it, the Apollo guys used it. I just burnt myself, by the way, this is very hot. Um, the Apollo guys used them and NASA used them. Uh, there's a story about Walt uh, Cunningham incessantly scratching the days off. So actually, I do that every day. I scratch the day off. Um, they uh, uh, they're very useful. And I changed my just changed mine to April the other day. Um, so those are that's the Forstner uh, JB Comfort band. I'm sorry, JB Comfort. Oh, JB Champion was the second company. Forstner Comfit was the original manufacturer. They, I believe they started making them in the 30s or 40s. And then JB Champion, um, Jacoby Bender bought them in like the 60s. And then they disappeared by the 70s. Um, they, uh, Luke, they did use them on the Bulova, the Accutron astronaut watches. I don't believe it was used on the, um, on the Bulova moon watch. Uh, the Bull of a Moon watch that Dave Scott wore on Apollo 15 and the watches that we sell, uh, the, the reissue of those from Bull of a, um, the quartz reissue of those, uh, was a one-off. Dave was the only one that wore it. Um, there were, I think there were only 20 of them made. Uh, they were based on a, um, uh, what was it, Space Compacts. I can't remember the name of the company. They were not made by Bulova. It was a Bulova branded other watch, and they were trying to get um, uh, trying to get NASA to use an American company for the space watch rather than using a Swiss company. Omega is a Swiss company, um, the Swatch Group. Um, even then, what was it? Oh, it was it Geneva? Yeah. So it's funny. Bulova was making this watch. It was actually made out of a Swiss watch. Uh, and they were they were trying to say, well, it's an American company. There was something about Omega was having parts shipped to the United States, and then they were building them in the U.S. So it technically was, you know, fifty percent made in the U.S. or something like that. I forget what the, you know, the little legalese on it was. Um, how did we make the patterns? Uh, we had several original flight jackets uh, from. The Apollo era, there were, uh, we had three uh, NASA flight jackets and two other non-NASA but flightwear made jackets, the same company, Flightwear by Land Manufacturing. Um, and essentially, we, we, without deconstructing them, we cr recreated those patterns uh, with our in-house pattern maker. And um, uh, unfortunately, they are proprietary. I, I, we cannot release them because a, a lot went into the development of those patterns. That is our, you know, that is our trade. Uh, that's our property. Um, but uh, like I said before, as you can see behind me, a few there will be a few different versions coming out. The non NASA versions will probably be a little bit less expensive because the development wasn't as uh, specific. The uh, the fabrics cost less because we didn't have them custom made. They'll be kind of off the rack, you know, black, white, olive drab stuff. They'll, they'll be off the rack uh, fabrics. Um, so we hopefully be able to produce a, you know, a civilian version, a fashion version that's a little bit more um, geared towards uh, a consumer price rather than kind of the niche market where our replicas are. Um, 
What suit is Max Peck wearing? Max Peck is wearing one of our Type 2 jackets over uh, Bob Overmeyer's original um, Apollo 17 era flight suit. So we are not currently making the gold flight suit. We will be making the blue uh, flight suits. Uh, we have made, uh, we've made two of every size <laughs> uh, blue flight suit. Um, However, uh, they're very difficult to make. Uh, we're, de we're deciding whether or not to make uh, s short and long sizes. Uh, we're kind of doing some research now with some testers. Uh, Adam Savage happens to be testing uh, our, our flight suit out right now too, because uh, he's, he's familiar with uh, flight suits. We've been sending them to people that uh, are in the military that, that wear flight suits all the time um, to help us figure out little, little tweaks. Uh, we only had one original flight suit to go off of, um, and uh, it, it was a smaller size, and it had actually been custom modified. The sleeves had been brought in at the shoulder. They cut the shoulder out and uh, shortened the sleeve at the shoulder. What is my favorite jacket? Oh, God, that's like asking, well, who's your favorite kid? Um, I love the type 1, type 2, and type 3. Uh, I, the only type 1A that, that I have seen completed was the one that Al was wearing, Al Warden, uh, and that came out very well. I think the type 1, the Al Warden type 1A jacket is a great hybrid of the two designs, um, and, uh, and I think that will prove to be my favorite. Uh, just barely, though. The type 2 jacket's phenomenal. I love wearing that blue jacket. Um, it's just so cool. And when you wear it right, if you get the right size and stuff, and you, you, you tuck your shirt in and you wear it above your belt and stuff, it just it just makes you feel like a million bucks. Um, I love leather flight jackets too, actually. My, uh, my, favorite, my favorite leather flight jacket, you'll see. My favorite leather flight jacket is the U.S. Navy G1. I think it is the best designed flight jacket. It is still, it has been in continuous service with the U.S. Navy uh, Aviation Division, um, the aviation branch, since I believe it was 1936 when they first adapted them. Um, the A2 jacket's really nice too. I love the A2. I'm not going to knock that, but the G1 is just better designed. Uh, if you wear a G1, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It it is it gives you full range of motion through your shoulders. Uh, it has a it, as you can see it has a bi swing back on both sides. Oops. It's comfortable. It's got an integrated fur collar. Um, it has knits. Uh, uh, this one the the knit sleeves have been cut out. A lot of guys did that, but uh, the knit the knit sleeves or uh, knit uh, cuffs. Let's see if I can put one on. Hang on a second. This is a World War II style one. The precursor to the G1 was the, uh, I think, the 422A. Uh, and it has some of the manufacturers had this big red lining on it. But just this is this is one of the coolest jackets. As you see the swing in the back, and if you're a pilot um, in a in a cockpit, especially especially if um, if you need to reach stuff over your head, you know you have an upper console, you've got stuff, you have levers and stuff in the front and on on the ground. You have to put the gear down or the flaps or whatever. Um, you can reach down and do that. In an A2 jacket, the back is all one piece of leather. This is like five pieces of leather. You can, it, it just feels the best uh, when you're driving around. Um, Mike, alert brutes, why a 12 plus? That's the size boot I wear. I want to try them out. <laughs> Mike uh, Apple, uh, Appleby, is that it? Mike, um, Mike's with Daner Boots. And uh, those guys made some of the original boots for the um, Mercury and Gemini program. 
Um, we're seeing if maybe we can do something with them. That'd be pretty cool if we could get some boots out. It's the only thing we don't make is shoes. Um, Converse All Star is the shoes that guys wore on the recovery ships. This thing looks nice. We are not making these just yet. This is made by a company, big shout out. Five Star Leather makes a really nice G1 jacket. Um, I don't know if they're operating right now, but uh, they make a nice one. Um, just make sure of your size when you order with them. Oh, what's neat is also, there's a great picture of Jim Lovell wearing his G1 jacket, and he has his Batgirl. This was from uh, VCN3, his Night Fighter Squadron in Korea. And he wore that right there. And then he had his name tag right there. So maybe I'll put this on my jacket. We sell these patches. And Jim Lovell has one now too. This isn't beer, folks. It's Bovril. Luke, you should appreciate that. <laughs> I see, looking for some more. Oh, hey, Christopher Mick. Yeah, those PT shirts are great. We're going to be making more of those. Those are one of our products that are made in a home shop. So once we get the fabric back in... Um, our lady and her daughter actually do them at a home shop, uh, and then they're silk screened by another guy. Um, uh, we'll be able to bring those back out. Uh, they really took off, by the way. We didn't expect PT shirts to really take off like that. Here's one thing, by the way. So we had been ink stamping the um, size into the, into the neck of the PT shirts. As we posted about a couple of times, they're ink stamped, and just we weren't getting the consistency that we wanted. Sometimes they were real faint, sometimes they were too dark, and they would go bleed through to the back. And as we found out, as as you wash these, the ink bleeds through anyway. It's just the type of ink that we used and the type of fabric that it is. It really soaks up that ink. This is waterproof ink and fabric ink. It just it, uh, we I don't know why um, we did tests and it went through anyway. So. We're probably going to switch to being it, having it as a silk screen, and uh, yeah. Anybody wear a three XL? I have an extra three XL. It's open box. If you want a three XL, send me a message. Um. Any other questions? While we're here. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Thanks everybody for joining us, man. I really appreciate um, everybody sticking around with us, with me. Yeah, so three XL makes a great night shirt. Oh, sorry about that. Just got a battery notification here. Now oh, we're gonna have to end this uh, in a little bit. The green jacket is not an L2, but it's similar. It's it's our Type 3 jacket um, in in green. Uh, we were just doing that as a test. Hey, Heather. Great. Hey, look, uh, I'm very happy to do this. It, it uh, It's nice to be able to connect with people and talk about stuff. I could talk about this every day, all day. Um, Especially what we're doing, you know, what, what I'm doing with Lunar Replicas uh, is, uh, is really quite fun. All right, so why don't I talk about just a little bit what I'm doing now. Um, I live by the philosophy of continual improvement. Uh, and I'm a, um, my, my uh, authenticity um, brain does not stop until something is as close to 100% as as you can get. 
So we had a whole set of dies made for, um, let me see, these were our first set of dies for doing the astronaut wings. And uh, there are three different types of Air Force wings. There's the command, senior, and basic pilot wings. Each one of those was done by NASA with, with a, uh, a little show and tell again. Sorry if I keep getting up. Everybody might not be familiar, but prior to um, 19, I believe 1962 was when they came out with the astronaut pin. As you can see, it's three, three uh, vectors, an orbit, and a star. That's basically what the astronaut pin is. Prior to the, uh, around the same time, rather, the military adopted the same symbol, but they put it inside of their regular, um, of their, of their regular wings. So these are naval aviator wings. Come on, focus. Come on, focus. Well, it'll eventually focus. Navy aviator wings, but they put that logo inside the shield. The Navy did it, the Air Force did it. Uh, and, of course, Navy wings are also worn by Marine pilots as well. So John Glenn got these wings as well. And they had the pin that they could wear on their lapel by itself. Anyway, <clears throat> we had these um, um, whatchamacallit, we had these dies made. And that was the first set of dies that we had made. And I wasn't that satisfied with the way the wings turned out. Uh, they were a little bit thin, and also the uh, the the it just didn't stamp well with the uh, the logo with the the astronaut logo in the center. For some reason, the the star kept dropping off, or the vector well you couldn't see the vectors, and they would they would all mesh into one big vector instead of three. Um, and you could plainly see that the original ones had the exact same problem, but they were still a little bit better than what we were getting uh, results-wise. And I know the machine wasn't the machine's fault, it wasn't the foil fault. The foil can do very, very fine detail. Um, it was the vector fault. It was the vector file that we sent to the, uh, the, the engraver. So, if this was the old... Uh, version. It's the new version. And I think that they look a little bit better. The anchor detail is a little bit nicer. Come on, focus again. Will it focus? You know what? Let's just do this. I'm going to turn it around so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay. You see the vector here was getting mushed together, and this was the, the lines were a little bit thinner than I wanted. It just didn't really match up with the the weight of the of the text. So we increased the thickness of each line, did a better version of the vector of the uh, of the star. As you can see, it's actually an outlined. Um, it's an outlined orbit now. It's an outlined vector rather than being a solid three vectors that mushes into one. So it's outlined. Let me put a little bit of detail in the anchor rather than it being plain. So I like this a lot more. This looks a little bit more like the original ones. It has a little bit more character. Um, Somebody, after the last time we had a, uh, a, a, a live thing, was wondering if they could do, if we could do a Navy air crew wing, and we did. That is the Navy air crew wing. So we now have that uh, off, that will be on the site at some point if you would really want to do, if you want to be a Navy air crew. So we do listen to people. <laughs> now, please, everyone, I, I, this is a very small shop. I love doing this stuff. It's for you guys. Um, and I want you guys to feel that you're included. So if you have an idea for something, 
Um, I'll show you this. We have a, oh, oh yes, in the Air Force version. So, this is Command Pilot. It's Air Force Command Pilot. This is the first style that we did. You see the star doesn't really, doesn't really get through on the vector. Uh, and then also the, uh, the wings are a little bit thinner. So, this is the new version. Very apparent that there's a star. A little A and B testing here. This is A for both of these. And then B is the improved version. So that was part of the holdup. Oh, you also, down here in the shield, you see the, the line for the shields were kind of melding together. I separated them just a little bit. But this has been a real learning experience. I've never done... Um, the Army did not have... Um, there were no Army uh, aviators that wound up in NASA, on, at least not in this time period. Um, so there was a different version. And there's something that we um, I've been testing. We had them done. NASA wings. Those were seen by the shuttle period and very late in the Apollo era. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if they were in the Apollo era, but I believe I've seen one, but it might have just been Fred Hayes. Um, Uh, international shipping, as far as I know, is still going. Um, I don't think that there's uh, there's they're stopping with that. And then the last thing here, oh, I dropped it. Last one that we did is just the NASA version two. Um, we don't have permission to do these just yet. I'm I'm still working on that, but we had the die made in anticipation. Um, if we if we get permission, then those will be offered on the site as well. Until then, they're, uh, those, they're just tease those, and we're not going to offer them for sale until uh, we're authorized to use the meatball logo in that form. Oh, I think we've been going for about an hour. Um. Folks, have any more questions? Meatball technically is public domain, but when you use it for um, when you use it for, I believe, when you use it for commercial purposes, uh, you have to get permission. Um, and it is a it, it's not a complex process, but um, it is uh, it, it is um, the right thing to do, and we're. We have been allowed all of the all of the meatball patches that we make, and to be able to sew them onto the jackets and sell them. As you can see, the gold jacket behind me, and the blue jackets. Um, we had permission from NASA to do that uh, in writing. Oh boy, what was I working on? Oh, I was doing one more. Um, set of wings for a very special friend of ours um, uh, as requested. We'll do that right now. Keep asking questions. I'll be here for another uh, 15 minutes or so while I do this. Um, if I can spell right, if I can't spell right, we'll be here for an hour. You guys can see exactly how long this takes to align this thing up. If I can get the right pieces in place, there we go. Hey Mark, um, that's a good question. Um, the uh, the question was, how long does it take in development? Um, <laughs> uh, uh, MOCR badges. I'm not familiar with that. 
Um, How long does it take in development from a, for a uh, replica product? It's a great question. It depends what it is. Uh, the jackets took over a year in development. A lot of that had to do with sourcing the uh, original pieces. Excuse me. So we had to wait till they came up in, uh, in either at auction or um, from a private collector that was willing to loan them to us. Um, um, so about three months, three to four months finding the original piece, and then about two months in uh, in patterning because we cannot. Uh, disassemble the original piece so it's trial and error so they'll pattern one make it out of muslin and then pattern it again and make it out of not muslin we do uh, the original size if the original piece was a size 38 or 40 or something um, I do the original size and then we grade it up to a larger size because we'd like to offer them in size up to 52 uh, at, at minimum um, we uh, uh, Scott, what's uh, what was the question that you had? I'm sorry, I see you mentioned that. Um, Scott Rhodes, if you have a question, feel free to ask here. Um, grading takes several months, uh, depending on how quickly or how 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 efficiently we're at we're good at it. Um, and when you're dealing with a brand new pattern, that can that that can take a while. Uh, at least this one took quite a while because. There's a lot of uh, fitment. A lot of this jacket relies on it looking right. And when you, um, you know, it, 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 because it's a historical piece, we want it to look the same, whether you're a size 38 or 40 or 42, which is what all of the astronauts were, or a size 48, 46 or something, a bigger guy. Um, I think the original ones went to a size 48, and that was it. Uh, there, and, and we can't get our hands on the one came up for sale. It was $9,000, so... That wasn't going to happen. So uh, uh, grading took about six months, honestly. Um, and then while we were grading, we were finding the fabric. The fabric uh, was uh, very difficult to find. Um, we had to engage a, uh, a firm uh, overseas to manufacture the fabric for us and then dye it um, because the fabric was not really being made. To, uh, to the same weight and specifications. The lining fabric was not being made, so we had that made from the ground up. And when I mean ground up, we, um, I think I ordered 2,000 yards of fabric on uh, to have it in stock so we could continually make jackets if we had to. Every jacket uses about four and a half yards. Uh, you know, cut size, you use about four yards. Um, Two yards for the shell, two yards for the lining, and the, based on how you line up the cut, so you can get the pockets in there too, and some of the other things. Um, so it takes a lot of work. Uh, I am not a garment manufacturer by trade or training. Um, I'm a historical. Um, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a historical complainer. <laughs> I know what I know what looks right. I know what feels right, and I know the level that we'd like it to be at. And then uh, I kind of hand off the rest of it, and then I, I go through an approval process with the manufacturer. Um, and I'm very very involved. Um, but a lot of the boots on the ground stuff is done by my manufacturer. So jackets took about a year. Uh, PT shirts took about four months. Um, <laughs> the bane of my existence has taken almost two years and we'll do a whole thing on these once we get a little bit farther down the road these are the sunglass case the NASA beta cloth sunglass case and I have 20 actual beta cloth these are made out of real beta cloth made by hand in in this shop real beta cloth cases um, sitting in a box what I don't have are the liners because the original liners were injection molded plastic and to get to do a run of injection mold uh, in the United States just for the first one 
is about seven or eight thousand dollars because injection molding costs a lot of money to get uh, the molds made and stuff like that. This is a 3D printed sample of what we're going to have made and still working on that. But um, we'll be doing we'll be doing um, we'll be we'll be offering a real beta cloth version, which will be relatively expensive because beta cloth is very expensive. But the real I mean it's real fireproof beta cloth. This is NASA retired beta cloth. And here's a here's another sample of the so two. Uh, they'll be closer to this. That's what they'll kind of look like. This one broke because I dropped it on the ground. Um, but this is that's what we hope to have out at some point later this year if we can get a contract with an injection molder. Um, things are looking pretty good. Uh, we've been working with um, very good friend of Luna Replicas to do the 3D modeling of this. Um, um, yeah, uh, Dane, I, I have had this one for over a year and a half. I, I use it. I, I've worn it. If you saw me at Space Fest, I had this exact one. I've banged it around. I've, uh, you know, I've taken this. I've traveled with it. Um, it really works. I really want to offer them. The ones we're going to be selling to everybody will be made out of... Uh, a very tightly woven nylon that that is similar to beta cloth it's not obviously it's not fiberglass but it's uh um it's a uh not it's a beta cloth simulant we could do a 3d molded version but not in bulk i mean the, the other thing is 3d 3d printed stuff is not that uh, is not as sturdy we want to have it done in abs so that it really does truly protect your glasses if you drop them um So that has taken almost two years to bring out. To answer Mark's question over the course of 20 minutes. Oh boy. We're doing a name tag. Keep asking questions and eventually I'll actually do the name tag. Whose name tag are we doing? That's a very good question. We're gonna do one for a very special Mr. Walt Cunningham. If I can find what I was working on. Non-clothing pro uh, uh, um, products in the works. Yeah, we're working on the uh, spoons, the Apollo uh, um, spoons uh, used on the Apollo program to eat food with. Um, I showed that in the last video. Uh, they are sitting on a shelf. I have a whole bunch of blank ones. Um, we're just trying to figure out how to do the stamping of the... Um, stamping of the um, the meatball logo on them yeah 3d printed we can do 3d printed they just uh, the the price per unit the price for each of these this is 3d printed uh, the price for each of these is astronomical and we want to do them in bulk and we want them to be cheap for everybody what, what we're looking at doing is putting out a nylon version with the plastic insert that's around you know 40 bucks um, and each nylon piece or each uh, each 3d printed piece like at some places in saying it was like $25 each or something just the size of it the size doesn't fit well on some of the mass production beds or something they'd have to do them in two pieces then mold them you know put it together all of that it, it in 3d printing is great right now 3d printing is great for prototyping it's not great for doing huge runs of things I want to make a hundred of these I want to make 500 of these so that I can bring the cost down and everybody gets them for a pretty decent price. Gee. What's been on your guys' playlists lately? Q. 
curious what everyone's listening to in quarantine. Helmet display piece. Yeah, um, Jay, that's a good question. Right now, we're kind of focusing on uh, everyday gear or stuff that people can use on a regular basis. Um, and some non-everyday gear things, but um, mostly... My, you know, the, the theory behind Lunar Replicas is uh, um, a little bit, a little bit cosplay, a little bit historical reenactment, and a lot of bit, um, um, everyday Apollo. What can you use every day? Uh, what can you use every day that is actually related to the Apollo program. Stuff that's stuff that was rated to use in space, why not use it every day, you know? Um, bags uh, our very good friend um, is doing bags. Mr. Adam Savage has his uh, EDC1 and EDC2 bags that are really close to uh, you know, sort of an Apollo style. I've got 5% battery left. We'll see how long we can go. Uh, EDC1, EDC2 bags. And then um, we also have... Uh, hang on a second. Sorry, I, I am running low on battery. I want you guys to see this before I, uh, before I go. Um, we're thinking about doing some bags. Uh, we have some friends that do bags, um, and we'll, you know, we'll, we've been pushing their stuff. Um, give me a second. I can't, I can't walk and chew gum, folks, as you, as you plainly see right now. Moonwalk by Goldfish. Cool. Anyone been watching uh, some of the Apollo movies and stuff like that? Um, Apollo 13 or uh, the series uh, From the Earth to the Moon? Whoops. Pants? No. No, we are looking at doing the uh, PT shorts. So PT shorts are going to come uh, at some point. But not right now. We're, we have a prototype, uh, but we have to get the fabric for it. I really want to keep making the uh, PT shirts first, and then we'll figure out the shorts. Yeah, from the Earth to the Moon. It's great. Uh, the new remaster looks beautiful. There's just a couple of things, and they redid the uh, the um, uh, special effects in that. Uh, the the um, space the space shots. I have heard from a number of people were not were actually not as accurate as the original space shots that they did. You know, with 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 models and stuff for the um, original series. Uh, from the Earth to the Moon, when they, when they did it um, in 95 or 6, I guess, whenever no, from the Earth to the Moon was, um, they redid a lot of those with CGI, and um, some of them were not accurate, actually, historically accurate. And if I start cursing, it's because I burned myself. Since the camera's backwards, you might actually be able to read this right side up. Yeah, Walt Cunningham, NASA MSC. See, that's one way to check this, actually. That's kind of funny. That's one way to check this without having to stamp it. That's cool. It's always backwards when you're printing. 
Luke, you've done some uh, letterpress printing before, haven't you? I remember you telling me you went to a seminar about that uh, for um, book conservation. Uh, Luke Clausen, everybody, if he's uh, still here, is the uh, historian at Hagley Museum, which is one of the uh, DuPont properties. Um, it was their powder yards on the Brandywine River. Um, it started in the early 1800s um, when the DuPont family came over from France. And it's one of the most wonderful and unknown museums uh, on the East Coast. It, it is absolutely amazing museum. Uh, and what he's doing now is obviously the same thing that we're kind of doing is online content, taking you through and showing you some of the stuff, the, uh, the DuPonts, uh, what, what's in the collection there, the Hagley Library is really phenomenal. Uh, and uh, he ran that for a little while or, or he was the uh, archivist. And now he's the site historian and can tell you absolutely everything about the place and it's really amazing. So check out Hagley Museum. This is not a paid advertisement, by the way. Hagley Museum on Facebook, and you'll see some of Luke's stuff on there. Really, really wonderful. All right, I'm going to start the timer on this. Oof. I'm going to wait about five minutes for this thing to get up to speed here, to get up to about 300 degrees. Frank Sinatra, Johnny Cash. Yeah, I was listening to Frank Sinatra today. Um, Fly Me to the Moon, of course. Um some other cool stuff. Frank's always good. Let's see how much I've got. How much battery do I have left here? Hang on one second. Three percent. Man, I gotta really charge the phone before I do this next time. That would help, right? All right, we'll be done in about five minutes once I stamp this out. Um, if it cuts out uh, beforehand, thank you all for joining. And I look forward to doing this more uh, in the evenings coming up. Um, not really on a set schedule, but if you guys have any ideas you wanna come talk to me, or you want me to talk about or show you guys, you have any questions about the uh, products or things that you think we could make, feel free. Something you guys want to make. If, you want, if you're an artist and you've got an Apollo thing you want to make um, uh, and, and feature on our website, or if you want to sell them to us and we sell them, or maybe a commission structure thing, something, even original pieces, mm -hmm. if, you, if you guys are artists, um, uh, if you guys are artists, um, well, I've been thinking about putting a section on the site for, for you know, fine art. Uh, people do some really good art stuff. You know, that, that, that's how Nova Space got started. That's how uh, uh, Space Fest became a thing, was doing, it was an art convention. It still is mostly an art convention. And um, as you all know, guys like Al, uh, Alan Bean, we're also artists in addition to being astronauts. Nicole Stott uh, is also, a, you know, a later astronaut who became an artist and the wonderful stuff. Um, as I talked about a little bit last time, how much it changed these guys going to space and being on the moon, how much it changed, not just going to the moon, being, being in Earth orbit, changes these people to, uh, you know, these astronauts to being um, artists. And um, that's really quite special. And if you're an artist and have something that's space related or you know, specifically from this time period, 1959 to 75, which is really Lunar Replica's time period uh, for now, um, come talk to me. I'd love to be able to put it up, help out our, our friends who are artists. Um, or makers, if you guys make stuff, if you're, uh, <laughs> I would love to do, you want a project that I would really love to do is some of the lunar equipment. I'd love to do um, the rock hammer, 
Somebody did that a couple years ago. I think they did in Italy or in Switzerland. They did the rock hammer uh, project. Um, I'd love to do the rock hammer. I'd love to do the uh, the golf club, <laughs> Alan Shepard's golf club on Apollo fourteen. Um, if you're a machine shop, uh, oh, uh, the the machetes that we're doing. I'm I'm trying to work with a with a local art or a, a small shop to do those. Uh, and Andrew Barth, um, uh, Anthony Kovacs, uh, hoping out, hoping that we can collaborate on something pretty soon. Oh, that was I'm sorry that I forgot to mention Anthony when we were talking about the bags. Anthony Kovacs makes these wonderful bags. Um, you know, they're they're sort of an interpretation of a, of a Gemini period bag, uh, Gemini or Apollo period bag. Um, yeah, Leland Melvin. Leland Melvin's wonderful. If you if you've been following him on Twitter, it's been pretty cool lately. Uh, he is another human being. I'm very we're very happy that we're on the same planet at the same time. All kind of here. Okay. So what we're doing here is we're pressing a new badge for Walt Cunningham because we changed the. Uh, Changed the um, style of the of the naval aviator um, dies. Something a little bit more accurate. Ow! I'm gonna start wearing gloves with this thing. That's probably the safer thing. I hear my Boy Scout master telling me to be safe. Safety first, right? And I might lose battery pretty soon, guys. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring a charger into the shop next time, and we won't we won't have this problem. Or maybe I'll just not talk as much, and then I won't need the battery. But where's the fun in that? Let's see. First stamp, and foil across. Walt Cunningham, NASA MSC, Apollo 7 astronaut, astronaut, and a Marine Corps veteran. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining me. We'll do this again very, very soon. Um, everybody, this has been a wonderful time. Um, and send me your questions and suggestions. We'll try to incorporate it next time. Take care. Stay inside. Stay safe. And uh, wish you well. Bye.